able to our message for today. So bow your heads with me. Lord, we just want to say thank you for being so good to us. Lord, I'm always reminded of that scripture that says, if it had not been for you who was on our side, we would have been swallowed up in victory. But Paul goes on to write that we should be thankful to you who has given us the victory yeah. through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we just pause, Lord, even in our, in our service time to again say thank you for saving us. Thank you for continuing to save us. Thank you, Lord, for bringing some of us to some moments today where we can begin to contemplate how we might engage even deeper with the work of your salvation. And so, Lord, as we enter this time of thinking about your words, we pray that your spirit would cause us to hear that which you want us to hear. Lord, I pray you remove my thoughts, uh, my aims, my uh, hidden agendas I don't even know about. Speak your word that would help us to be formed into people who follow you in ways that build the world that you're making. And Lord, we want to say all this in your name. And everyone say amen. 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 All right. We're going to be uh, talking uh, today from the gospel according to Luke, the 17th chapter. I'm going to be talking uh, with us today about the topic, outsiders. We're going to be talking about outsiders today. Um, it's interesting because I think all of us in different ways and spaces in our lives um, operate, may identify as outsiders in, in different ways. And so we're going to just talk about that a little bit today from one of the uh, stories of Jesus. Luke uh, chapter 17, and uh, I believe it was on the screen, but I think it just decided to go off the screen. So I'm going to read it for us if you want to read in your Bibles. Uh, Luke 17, uh, beginning at the 11th verse. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem, uh, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God? except this foreigner. Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. We're going to talk a little bit today uh, about uh, outsiders. You know, as I was thinking, this kind of was something as I was uh, traveling over the course of this week, and for some reason this whole idea of outsiders was coming uh, on my mind and on my heart, uh, just this sense that in our world, it's interesting, our world I feel like is like this huge mosaic where there's all these different pieces on how we identify as human beings, right? The world is very complex. It's very complex, and I'm just continuing to appreciate that anymore, I mean more and more, because we have so many different ways in which we are all understanding ourselves, ways in which we're understanding our places in the world, and it's very easy for us to land in places where we feel like we are outsiders. And we're trying to think about how do I fight for my life? How do I fight for what I believe I deserve? How do I fight for justice? How do I fight for what it is that I want to receive? The thing I love about the scriptures is that nothing that we are experiencing now is new. Right? That the human condition just repeats itself in cycles and cycles. And I believe there are some truths that God wants to invite us into. As we look into this story, one of the things that's really interesting is uh, Jesus is living in a very uh, kind of supercharged environment with a lot of different kinds of division. You have Jesus living as a Palestinian Jew, as we oftentimes talk about, under the, on the underside of the Roman Empire. So Jesus has, and his people, have this interaction that's happened with the Roman Empire. And yet, in light of that, they also have this dysfunctional way that they are operating with another people group in the region called the Samaritans. 
that they themselves are victims of oppression. They themselves are considered outsiders in the larger conversation of the empire, yet they in turn are demonstrating that same kind of judgment, that same kind of dehumanization to their neighbors, the Samaritans. Yes, yes. Isn't it interesting that, that the same things we don't want done to us, we just find ways to do it to other people? Right? I don't, I don't want you to talk about me, so I go talk about you to somebody else. Okay. Right? I don't want to be treated this way, so I end up treating someone else that way. And so here, in view of this, Jesus is living in this land where particularly the church and the people, well not the church, the synagogue, the, those that were practicing the, the Jewish faith as Jesus was, uh, they had identified these people as a part of their community. When these uh, certain people, these Samaritans, were coming around, they had very strict rules on how they could engage or not engage with the Samaritans. Then you had this other group that popped up called the lepers. Now the interesting thing, when we read lepers in the scriptures, oftentimes we think about somebody that's like dragging his leg, you know, with like three fingers. Sometimes they probably had three fingers, but sometimes it wasn't that extreme. When you look back at this time, a leper was someone because of the practices around cleanliness and the practices uh, that, that they really believe kind of helped them, the Jews help uh, uh, maintain their position with God. A leper was anybody who got some kind of skin condition that people did not understand. And they forced you to go live outside the community. Because the fear was what you have might contaminate what we're trying to preserve. Hmm. I just had a thought cover me that was interesting. <laughs> that what you have, I think, might contaminate what it is that we're trying to preserve. But I think one of the things that's powerful is to recognize that Jesus came not for those who already found themselves as a part of the in crowd. Yeah, right. But Jesus comes for those who the empires and the systems have cast outside yes. of the community. And I think one of the things that it lifts up for us, I want to invite us to be reflective today, I believe it's important that Jesus said even to those people then, is he said, when you are always trying to find ways to understand yourself as an insight, you actually are locking out your place and position with me because I came to engage with the outsiders. So the more we try to align ourselves with the power structure, could it be the more that we actually distance ourselves from the movement of God in the world? Amen. Jesus talks about, I came not for those who can already see, but I came for those who are blind. And Jesus says, those who think they can see are blind themselves. So as we think about this story, I, I love the life of Jesus because Jesus is always positioning himself in places to engage with the outsider. I want to say to some of us today, regardless as to how you understand yourself and you understand your life, I want to give you some hope and some good news that if you see yourself or view yourself as an outsider, Jesus exists to interact with you. In whatever ways that you've been kicked out of life, whether it's because of, of, of different things of how you understand yourself or how people understand Understand you that Jesus has come to interact with you. In this passage, it's really uh, interesting because Jesus comes walking um, on his way to Jerusalem, but he walks on the border between Samaria, Samaria and Galilee. Jesus positions himself between those who are part of the in crowd and those who are part of the out crowd. Now, as Jesus is coming into this village, the Bible says that there are ten lepers who see Jesus afar off. And they begin to cry out, Jesus, have pity on us. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Here's one of the things that I first want to share with us as outsiders is that we, one of the things that we must ensure that we keep in our minds is that regardless of the ways in which we understand ourselves as sometimes being outside of the story of God or the ways that people have pushed us out or the ways we understand our way out, that we must ensure that we don't allow that way of how we see our lives and see ourselves to divert our attention that we all firstly need the mercy of God. One of the things I think is important, this 
this mercy of God is that while we, there are a lot of things in the world that we want to fight for in terms of justice, things that we want to fight for in terms of our rights, things that we want to fight for in terms of our humanity, we must ensure that firstly, we recognize that what is going to set us free is the mercy of God. In, in the organizing language, one of the lines we use is that the first revolution is internal. That God is trying to start a story and write a new story in my life which ensures, well, which means that I must be pursuing the mercy of God. The reason I lift this up is oftentimes when we are outsiders or we're feeling ourselves as outsiders, it becomes very easy for us to keep our eyes on what everyone else needs to do. We have our eyes on what does society need to do to treat me the way I feel I should be treated. We have our eyes on what should the church do to treat me the way that I should be treated. We have our eyes on one another. What should you do to treat me the way that I should be treated? We got our eyes on everybody else except for ourselves and how we need the mercy of God. We must ensure that we are recognizing that uh, uh, the laws that we get passed, that we need to pass, are not what will set you free. The, the work that we do in the community, which is incredibly important, is not what will set you free. It is the mercy of God in our lives that brings freedom to the things in which we are challenged with and the ways in which we understand ourselves. Now that means that sometimes we have to adjust our lenses that we're wearing. I got a slide up here with some glasses on. We need to uh, adjust our lenses because sometimes the lenses that we're wearing is causing us to see other people and life in ways that aren't real. Yes. Oh, right? Have you, have you ever put on uh, a pair of strong prescription glasses that don't belong to you? <laughs> Isn't it interesting how the world changes when you put those on? Now those same lenses are helpful for someone else who needs to see better. But when you put them on, it distorts your vision. What we have to realize is all of us are walking around with a pair of glasses on. Our lenses of how we are seeing the world. And when we come to uh, interaction with Jesus, Jesus is always trying to challenge the way that we're seeing life and invite us into the way that he wants us to see life. Well, we don't know. We got a line that we say here often that if God always agrees with you in your mind, look at, look at your neighbor and say, that's not God. <laughs> if God is always your amen corner, yeah. right? Everything you believe politically, God agrees with you. Yeah. Every lifestyle choice you make, God agrees with you. Yeah. Every person you want to engage with, God agrees with that. Well, what you need God for? Amen. God just riding in the back of your little red wagon. You and God just going down the street of life. <laughs> no, that God is actually trying to change the way that we see the world. The way that we see ourselves. And recognize that even if you don't understand yourself as a social outsider, we were all born into sin and thus we're outsiders with God. Now, I know you feel very, I know some of us feel very good about ourselves, right? You got more degrees than a the thermometer, right? You know, you feel real, real strong and wonderful about yourself, but that still does not cause you to be relieved from the fact that we were all outsiders with God. And there is no degree you can get. There's no job you can get. There's no amount of money you can make. There's no relationships you can form that will rid you from the need of having the mercy of God. Yeah. The reason I'm trying at this point is because oftentimes, not y'all, not very spiritual people here at the way, but sometimes in my life when things are challenging or I'm finding myself uh, coming up against some obstacles, sometimes my first thought is not to cry out for God's mercy. Yeah. Sometimes my first thought is to think about how do I get you out my way? If you are my obstacle, I'm trying to figure out how do I remove you? What kind of, not y'all, again, y'all very, y'all, y'all swim around in baptismal water every day. You, you, you were born, you know, anointed oil and sweats out your glands and all. So not for all the very spiritual people. 
But we must remind ourselves that when we find ourselves running into the crisis because of the ways in which we've been positioned outside of society or outside of different circles, that we don't see our lives through those lenses, but we cry out for the mercy of God. Yeah. That what is going to deliver me, what is going to save me is the mercy of God. It's an eternal truth, regardless as to what we see or understand. Now, this means that, that we're going to go through a little negotiation in our spiritual journey. Yeah. We'll have a little debate with God. I don't believe that following God means that, that, that we're not going to have negotiation. We're not going to have debate. We're not going to have those times where, where we're bumping up against uh, what we want to do and what God is calling us to do. But I think it's important for us to recognize that negotiation and that debate is really for you, not for God. God knows what God wants to do, whether you agree with it or not. God knows how you need to be, whether you think you need to be like that or not. God knows who you need to be with relationally, whether you want to be with them or not. God knows who you don't need to be with, whether you want to be in that or not. Let the person next to you say, God knows. God knows. Oh, some of y'all give me some of them looks like, oh, I know this Negro didn't just say that. <laughs> and for anybody, if, if Negro offended you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but outsiders must be positioned to ask for the mercy of God. I want to drive that point for us to be thinking about that God is asking for us what cold is the distance from those who are outside is not what we do with our own strength but it is the mercy of God yeah. and God coming into the world is all about closing the distance between man and God's self that God wants to close the distance that God wants to invite you into the life of healing and the life of change and the life of transformation but my, my second point is this sense that outsiders must follow the way of Jesus in order to get to a place of healing that we must cry out for mercy, but ultimately we must follow Jesus' instructions so that we can end up in the place that Jesus is calling us to. I like it in, in this story uh, that Jesus, when they get there, Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they go, the scripture says that they were healed. Now here's the thing, they came and said, Jesus, have mercy on us. Nowhere in this particular story do we have Jesus initially telling them, you're healed. Mm. <laughs> Rather, Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. And y'all remember that movie, The Karate Kid? Not the new one, the old one. <laughs> that new Karate Kid, I don't know how I feel about all of that. You know, you know, when you watch the real Karate Kid, you know, something about Will Smith's son and Jackie Chan just didn't do it for me, right? <laughs> Or something real powerful about Mr. Miyagi, right? Anybody remember Mr. Miyagi? Let's give it up for Mr. Miyagi, right? But I remember in the original Karate Kid, there was this scene where Mr. Miyagi was inviting Daniel's son, right, into many practices that didn't seem to scratch the itch that Daniel was trying to scratch. Right? Mr. Miyagi kept inviting him into practices where Daniel said, I want to learn karate. So he told him to go paint the fence. Daniel said, I want to learn karate. He told him, wax the car. Y'all remember that wax song? He said, I want to learn karate. He told him, go, uh, what was it, paint the fence, sweep the floor. And Daniel was profoundly frustrated. Because he was like, I am trying to learn something that I need in order to defend myself from the potential onslaught facing my life. But what Mr. Miyagi did was, he was forming his different way and he was building inside Daniel discipline through obedience. I want to talk to us really quickly today. I'll yell at y'all later. <laughs> But I want to talk to us because there is something very powerful that happens when we give ourselves over to the discipline of obedience with God. Yeah. That following God is not always going to be very sexy and attractive. Right. That some of it is just listening to what God says yeah. and doing it whether we can see the end result connected to the invitation to act or not. Yeah. Jesus tells the leper, go show yourself to the priest. I got a man. 
imagine as those folks started walking down the street, like, man, I told you we should have talked to Jesus, man. You were the one coming out. Like, Master, have mercy on us. Dude didn't even touch us. He didn't even kneel us. Here we are walking down our already done been outside the community and off. We, we oftentimes get into all this type of way. Lord have mercy. Without recognizing that the obedience that Jesus is inviting us into is the roadway to healing. That Jesus is trying to build in us a discipline. Following Jesus' way leads to healing, not our own way, not our cultures, not even our preferential way. That following Jesus means that we don't come to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to follow you in this invitation to healing. I recognize I need your mercy. <laughs> so I'm willing to walk onto the road of healing as long as it meets all of my cultural norms. <laughs> so Jesus, you can heal me, but you got to heal me like this. <laughs> You got to heal me like this with all the different isms that bother me or don't bother me. Jesus, you've got to heal me in a very politically correct way that also agrees with how I like to worship. You need to heal me in ways that actually don't cause me to sweat because I'm really not into that. Jesus, heal me in ways that actually don't cause any sacrifice. Heal me in ways, I'm willing to follow you as long as it meets this way, the way that I'm able to intellectualize what it is that you want me to do. But listen. What we have to remember is, Jesus didn't need to be healed. The leper did. So how does the leper tell Jesus how they need to be healed? I used to, when I was running City Team, and it was a you know, big organization that had uh, a lot of brothers who were changing their life, very powerful ministry, still a powerful ministry that I love and volunteer at. But I used to tell the brothers in my program, I used to say, listen, they would come in my office and be like, you know, with all due respect, Ben, like, I don't just feel like, how somebody you only in your 30s, and how you gonna tell me, like, what it is that I need to do, and how I, what decisions I need to make, because I know what I need to do. I used to say, listen, man, if you knew what you needed to do, you wouldn't be here. And I would tell them, not in a disrespectful way, but you got to be open to follow these instructions. You see, a part of our journey, I believe, is God putting us on a flight simulator. Okay. Where God is trying to teach and form us, not just into people that can be healed, but ultimately into people who can be healed and then become healers for others. But in order to do that, we've got to have the mercy of God, and we've got to be willing to follow the Jesus way. There's this parable of two sons where uh, there was, uh, go to the next one, there was one son who, I believe it's in Matthew uh, 21, you guys should read this when you get a chance, uh, there's one son, it, it says in this parable that uh, the master asked the son to go and work in the vineyard. And the son said, yes, I will go, but never went. Go ahead, go ahead. And, and then he told the second son, he said, go, and the son said, no, but then finally, he repented and he went. We must ensure that we don't become the sons who simply are daughters. Yeah. All right. Now I'm on no trouble, right? We must ensure that we become the children of God, who when God tells us to do something, we don't just get the rhythm in the rhythm of saying yes, but never do it. That Jesus is going to invite us into hard decisions that challenge us. I'm not talking about the work that we're doing in the community and the work that we're doing in the world. I'm talking about the work that God is trying to do in us. <laughs> that there are things I believe Paul writes in. He says all things might be lawful, but they're not expedient. They're not profitable. That we all have the right to do whatever it is that we want to do. But it doesn't always mean it's the best thing for us. Yeah. So we must be listening. How might Jesus be willing, or how might Jesus be trying to call me into a way of obedience that I might be healed? When we hear what challenges us, oftentimes our nature is to defend home base. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of the comments I may have made today made some of your, you know, personal Department of Defense mechanisms come up. <laughs> I don't know what he's alluding to. What is he alluding to? What is he, what's his secret agenda? What's he trying to get me to say? So then all of a sudden, your 10-foot wall comes up. 
all your, all your mental soldiers come out and position themselves because I don't want any three to disrupt my boat. I like myself, I like my life, and I don't want to make any changes. I just want God to bless me. That's it. I just want God to bless me. I remember I was, when I was pastoring at another church before I left, and I had a guy who was a high-level engineer, right? This guy was making big money, doing some really great engineering work, and his life was falling apart. Right, so we said, Ben, I just want to come meet. Can we do some counseling? I was like, yeah. So we're meeting, and he said, so here's the thing. It's a true story, right? He said, so here's the thing. Because I told him, I said, listen, man. I said, you know, we all want more of God. We need more of God. He said, no, listen, I don't want more of God. <laughs> he said, I want more of God. I just want God to bless my finances. I want God to help me get into a good relationship and keep everything steady. But I don't want more of God. <laughs> I mean, that was like a screwball. I was just sitting there like, how do you answer that statement? But the reality is that God is inviting us into a place where it means it's supposed to challenge us. Yeah. That God wants us to be in a place where we are continually asking God, does my life live in alignment with what it is that you're calling and directing me to do? As outsiders, we must request the mercy of God and seek the mercy of God. We must be willing to follow Jesus' way to get to a place of healing. And we must also be committed to be people who are living in a culture of praise to God. That a part of this, when the, when the lepers, it says when they started on their way and they were headed towards the temple, it says that they, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, I can park right there, right? Because everybody said the word process. process. Say it again, process. process. So you see, when Jesus sends his man and his friends to the temple, while they were on their way, the healing came. I just want to park real quick to tell somebody, whatever it is you're going through, there's a process that God wants to get you in. And I know it feels a little heavy right now, and you don't want to hear some, you know, loud dude on the microphone telling you stuff's going to get better. But I'm telling you that God wants to invite you into a process. Yeah. Now, in that process, you're going to be frustrated. In that process, you're going to be annoyed. In that process, you're going to get a little dirty. In that process, you're going to have people telling you stuff you don't want to hear. But God wants to invite you into a process so that God can heal you. Yeah. Somebody say process. process. So that means when it gets a little heavy, you might need to just get in the mirror, look at yourself and say, I know you feel like giving up today, but God's got me in a process. I know my money is not what I want it to be, but God's got me in a process. I know I'm depressed and I'm feeling suicidal, but God's got me in a process. And as long as God's got me in a process, I say, God, whatever it is you want to do in my life, do it well, so I can become who you're calling me to be. I didn't mean to get all that, but I felt something in my spirit with that process. And God is trying to work us through a process so we can become who God is calling us to be. It says, as they were healed, that one of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, he stopped and turned around and came back to Jesus to say thank you. One of the things I want to lift up for us is that we must ensure, what, one of the things that we must ensure is that we have a commitment in a world that's all about taking all the glory for yourself. To be people that live in a lifestyle of giving all the praise and glory to God. But we must ensure that for every good thing that happens in our life, for every trial that we make it through, for all the ways in which God shows up in our life, that we are careful to give God all the praise and to be a culture of people who praise God. This number had a lot to be focused on other things. But when he recognizes that he's been healed, he comes back to give some praise to God. You see, the fall of the outsider, because some of us have known how we've been put on the outskirts, that should fuel how we praise even the more. And we must also be people that recognize that when we are following Jesus, a part of that means that we will demonstrate to the world the goodness of God by leaning into the culture of a praise. That means that when things are happening in our life, we live in a discipline of giving praise to God. That we don't live to pull glory for ourselves, but we live to give praise to God. What would it look like if we embrace the discipline? 
to always be ones who deflect personal glory and give it to God. How else will the world see God unless they see it both through our work and through the way that we live in a culture of praise? When we praise God, we affirm what and who we believe in, and this empowers our accessibility to change. Yes. That we must praise God. Who do we praise God? One of the reasons that uh, I live in, the, you know, I grew up in a, in a Pentecostal tradition, which means, you know, we loud and we get saved every week. <laughs> every week, somebody say amen, right? But I, but I love that one of the things I appreciated out of coming out of that expression was we learn to praise God. We learn to push past our physical limitations to praise God. We learn that giving glory to God, that giving honor to God was more important than how we felt. That pursuing God and pursuing God's presence meant that we had to say things that sometimes we didn't want to say. It meant that when we got tired, we had to keep praising, that we had to keep giving God's name the glory, that we had to continue to give God's name the honor because God's name was due. That God the praise for God's name. in the greatness of how we've been healed, that we miss coming back to give God the glory of what God has done in our lives. One of the things that I've heard from many friends who travel abroad and, and has ministered in different uh, spaces and circles in, in, in you know, global uh, context, particularly when they would talk about many of our brothers and sisters in many of the countries in Africa, I think it was our youngest brother that was telling me, he said, one of the things that amazed me most when, uh, I think he was in Namibia, I, I'm not sure the country he was in, but he said when I was there was to watch the way in which people praised God. He said people praised God like there was going to be no tomorrow. They didn't bring this kind of lackadaisical, oh, thank you, I'm just, you know, thank you so much for my latte, thank you so much for, you know, the way in which you bless my Facebook, I've got 64 new followers on Twitter, and I just want to bless you. But he talked about this kind of deep, connected praise, that people praised God for hours, that they gave their whole life, their whole energy, everything that they had to praise God. And I want to invite us, friends, to think about how might we give our whole selves to be those who praise God in ways that begin to lift up the name of Jesus. In ways that show folks that if you want to be healed, the way to be healed is to follow Jesus. And as you follow Jesus, you will see God do amazing things in our lives, but those of us who follow Jesus will never take the credit for ourselves. But we will always give the credit to God. That we will eliminate boasting and pride. And rather we will distract ourselves with giving praise to God. I say this today, that in our world it's very easy for us to get focused on how we're understood. We got a lot. The world is getting even the more complex. And sometimes where I try to, you know, I feel like God's been checking me lately. And so maybe this might be for you as well, is a sense of how do we not allow, how do we not, how do we keep the main thing, the main thing? That God is trying to reconcile my life to him. And as my life is reconciled to God, I will allow, I will be allowed to be an agent that can help reconcile the community to God, to reconcile our cities to God, to reconcile our nation to God, to reconcile the world with God. That God wants to close the gap, but that doesn't happen by my ability to understand the problem. That happens as I continue to give myself up to God. Say, God, give me your mercy. God, give me the discipline to follow the way in which you're calling me to walk. And as you begin to show up in my life, God, help me to be an instrument of praise. It helps many more people see that you are still real. You still have impact. 
you can still bring a change to people's lives. There's a lot of important things that need to happen in our world. What well, I want to encourage us today is to be a little reflective on the inside. What are the ways in which you felt like an outsider? What are the ways in which you recognize there being distance between you and God? How might God be calling you to ask for mercy? Rather than us defending all the different ways that we are, the ways that we see life, how are we willing to open up our hearts and our minds to say, Lord, is there anything you want to change about me? I know I got the right to be whoever it is I want to be. But who are you trying to call me to be? There's another scripture that says, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run this race with patience. This race that's been set before us. Also in Proverbs 12, I believe it's Proverbs 12. It says that there is a way, Proverbs 14, there is a way that seems right to us, but the end of that way leads to death. I don't want to be walking a way that leads to death just because it's familiar to me. When God might be trying to invite me into a different way to be, Maybe it feels like painting the fence, waxing the car. You know, some of us wake up, like, now I want to go to church. For what? It's the same thing over and over. Some of us say, I don't want to pray. Pray don't work. I hear that a lot in our protest movement, right? We don't pray long enough. Now, there's a critique of that that, that has some truth to it. Like, what I say is, we, we only pray and not follow so that prayer was an action. But that doesn't mean we stop praying. It doesn't mean that we stop searching the scriptures, asking God to tell us how to paint the fence, wax, the car. So I just want to invite us, encourage us today. God wants to bring you to a place of healing in, in different ways in our lives. Maybe we be thinking about, Lord, how are you calling me to follow your way? How do I make myself available to change? Come on, stand up and feed